and I guess we're 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 in a space of, of change, you know, and and in in a sense, we're in a in a, a landscape which is very very distant from from what was here pre-settlement, and here you can you can see. You know, just a, a lovely aerial shot that, that picks up the Botanic Gardens, Government House, the Yarra River, the sporting grounds, the, the, the central business district, and sort of down in the down in the end, you can sort of see where Westgate Park's sort of going to be along the along the river. So, so we're in a in a space which is, um, I, I suppose, as uh, as removed from a natural ecology as you could possibly get. And and so part of our challenge at the moment is to to think about that space and to to think about who, how we can reconnect to nature and, and what are the benefits and what are the motivations of, of, of what is a city. And so here you might recognise um, this is the Yarra River uh, you know, a few years ago, but not that long ago. It's only 1830, so a very, very short time ago. And, and you can see where um, the, the sort of the tidal point was where we had fresh water upstream and, and, and the brackish water downstream, which now occurs up at, at Dykes Falls. So this is the site of Melbourne. You jump on. If you, if you look at the, the eucalypts on the left, are a little bit of a litmus for us, and you can see that things started to, to sort of move relatively quickly to a point where we, we started to really dominate the landscape. And you can see the, the euc on the left is really expressing its opinion on what we've done with regard to, to settlement. You know, so even from sort of very early days, I think we, we, we have had and probably still do have a bit of a frontier mentality. We, 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 I think we view our land as being an endless resource which is going to be continuously able to provide for us and, and the mining mentality is sort of, you know, something that's been in a, a, a forefront and I think, you know, sort of in, in recent political debates we've had this sort of mining tax with so all this money coming in but the mining industry only gen generates 4% of GDP. Our cities and housing develop over 8% of GDP but where are the conversations about what that housing should be and could be in its role. So in a really short period of time, we've, we've enormously transformed the landscape. And, and so we've, we've, we've sort of disconnected ourselves. And, and I think not only with regard to how the city functions, but we're disconnecting ourselves as humans from nature. And, and Australia is the most urbanised population in the world, which is a little bit surprising. But no other city <coughs> in the world has more people living in a dense city than, than, than Australian cities do. So where we were not that long ago to where we are now. So on the right is kind of the space that we're in and trying to understand and, and then trying to, to work with nature to, to bring us in. And you can see urbanisation is, is huge and it's increasing and, and it's going to become more important. So the role of cities is going to become more and more important all the time. And how we live in the cities is, 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 is going to be increasingly. So if we, we have a look, and just a, a couple of images to talk about change, and I've shown sort of the change that sort of brought us up to now, but that change is continuing onwards. And Sarah's identified some of the challenges that, that we have with the urban sprawl, but even within our existing city, you can see here not that long ago, so 1988 when we had a population close to 40,000 and 24% green cover. If we jump forward to 2009, we've tripled our population and nearly halved our green cover. And, and that's not healthy, and that change is continuing. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. If you have a look at Singapore, in the same time, look, so 86, 35% green cover, population of 2.7 million. If you jump forward to 2007, doubled the population and significantly increased their green cover. So that, so that comes through planning and through legislation and work that we've done looking at cities around the world the ones that have greened up, whether it's Chicago or New York or Malmo in Sweden, whatever, it's because they've got a really big stick and it's called legislation. It's not through a carrot, although that's an important component of things, but if we want to green the city, a really big stick. So getting into the planning space is where we need to get into and a lot of our work and our partnerships in exploring the role of greening and types of greening in the city is, is around that. So our goal and what we want to do is to have our city being in a forest rather than having a forest in the city. And, it, and it's a shift in mindset. And I think that's the kind of space that we're in, is trying to have a range of conversations with a huge range of partners, with, with visitors, with, with residents, with workers, to, to, to get them to think about and understand the city in a, in a really different way. And in a sense, the city's not working particularly well at the moment, and we need to really sort of shift it on. So I thought I'd sort of share just a, a recent experience which has brought a smile to our face. 
And, and part of it's about the conversation that we're having with the community. And, and for us, developing our understanding of, you know, in a sense, it's us, us going out to the community and asking the community, what do you want us to do with your forest? So instead of this sort of us versus them mentality, it's starting to engender a sense of understanding of the importance and the role and the functionality of, of green space in our city. And, and this is some of the work that we've been doing around our precinct, precinct planning. And this one was around, around South Yarra and we work with our rangers. And we have some fantastic extension programs that are going in, in Royal Park where we do ecology and biology of native vegetation and water and, and these ranges deal with kids from schools like St Michael's. They're boys that are 12 years old <coughs> that have never climbed a tree. It's unbelievable and, and the teachers talk about the benefits that the kids when they come back into the classroom are attentive, they remember what they're doing and they're focused. So, so the benefits of nature I, you know, aren't, aren't sort of questioned and we've got science coming out our ears that tell us how good nature is and how important it is for us. And I think part of our challenge is how do we take that knowledge and translate it to outcomes on the ground? And what do those outcomes on the ground need to be in, in cities? I was interested, I recently read a bit of research from, from Helsinki that was looking, this is stuff that's coming out of medical journals, and it was looking at the health of people relative to bacteria load on their skin. And so they measured the health of people living in country areas that had really high bacteria loads versus people in this city that had low bacteria loads. Guess who was healthier? The people in the country. So, you know, it's, it's, it's there and, and recently you may be sort of, you might have heard of, of the work that's sort of been done, came out of a medical journal in the US that was looking at emerald ash borer, which has killed something like 25 million ash trees through the US. And they directly related it to an increase in cardiovascular and respiratory disease and death in human population. And there's a direct correlation between death of trees and death of people. Other research sort of looks at socioeconomic stuff. So in recent times, we've sort of come up with all this research that sort of says trees keep you alive, they make you richer, and they make you smarter, and they make you happier. So it's all, it's all out there. So how do we translate that across? And for us, the trees are kind of the most important greening element that we've got in a city that we can do. So how do we work with that? So if you jump on, and one of the things that we've, we've done to, to connect with people and have that conversation is, is this, which is our, our urban forest visualisation, which has recently come up on, on site. And, and, and we worked with a, a guy from Urn Creative, Greg Moore, to develop this. So there's a lot of sort of digital art that goes into it, which has been really good and it's been up for some awards and stuff. But if you jump on, we're, 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 what we're doing is really just showing people and giving people access to know what the trees are in various streets. And, and you might be familiar with sort of what we've called the useful life expectancy, which is us trying to get an understanding of strategically how we need to plan for change in our city. Because a lot of our trees are really old and they suffered terribly during the, that millennium drought and water restrictions and things. So, this is part of expressing that and some of the conversations and we've enabled people to, to talk to the trees, which has sort of been fun, but you know, what are the different ways that we can do it? So we, we enable people to actually send a message. And so here's just a couple of messages that people have, have put in. And so there, um, you know, we, we, we realise that people connected to nature during the drought. So, so that there was a real recognition of the, the importance of, of nature. And if you jump on, um, this one's down at the, the Golden Elm down in South Yarra. Um, you know, lovely messages. So simply by us <coughs> opening this door to enable a conversation has been this incredibly rewarding opportunity that's come forward. And I think in terms of all of us who are the converted, looking to convert, this is a fantastic <coughs> way to, to actually do it. And if you, you jump on, and here we go. Look at that, you make me happy. <coughs> Fantastic. And if you, if you jump on again, and this one, the, the tree decided to have a conversation back with this person. <laughs> so, so, so Jamie started off, you're a nice tree, and I can see you, that's great. So the tree wrote back, thanks Jamie for your email, I hope you're well. Blah. Then, then Jamie goes, um, Chinese or more, can I call you Dale, which I really like. <laughs> Loving the weather, but I'm inside and jealous that you're outside. And so, of course, the tree who's outside says, well, look, I'm stretching my stomata and giving my chloroplasts a good workout. <laughs> and, I, and I spent the weekend well hydrated. And, of course, so Jamie comes back to Dale and talked about his weekend of rehydrating after a big Friday night. So, so, so 
lots of, I mean, whilst it's lots of fun and incredibly entertaining, it, it, it really just sort of talks about how we can, we can really expand and have the conversations. And I think with, you know, we've heard some of the, you know, the talk about Westgate Park and some of the potentials and opportunities that are down here. And, and I know I've sort of lived in Williamstown for the last 20 years and, and, and have just enjoyed watching the transformation of Westgate Park and been really impressed by what's been achieved over that journeys that I have over backwards and forwards over that bridge. So it's, it's a great story and it's a really important space. So, you know, are there, are there ways that we can start to connect and talk about some of these things? So for us, these are some of the key strategies that, that are driving and guiding our thinking at the moment. And, and, and you're really familiar with, with, you know, climate change, the challenges that we've got of, of population growth. And, and I think for us, uh, we've got a huge investment going into how we're adapting our landscapes to the changes that are occurring. So increased temperatures and, and, and extremes of weather. And, and I think it's important for us to, to understand, if you like, how we can understand the ecology and have diversity and resilience in that space so that our landscapes are going to be healthy to the future. And I know that, you know, simple examples for us and, and some, some facts with the, with the bushfires in Victoria in 2009, we had a heat wave with that. And, and there was 160 odd people that died directly as a result of the bushfires. Close to 400 people died in Melbourne because of excessive heat. There's no natural disaster that kills more people than excessive heat in Australia. That's going to get worse. So what's the functional role of the ecology of our city and our green infrastructure in cooling the city and making it a healthy, viable place to live? So that sort of, that, that sort of work. But, but the other thing that happened to us, that in our CBD we've got you know, and we have something like 75,000 trees that we manage, but 70% of the trees within our CBD grid are London Plains, which we always thought was the, the bulletproof perfect street tree. But we nearly lost most of them. They just don't cope with heat. And, and, and you can sort of get into the ecology of the trees and think, well, something with a big, broad, horizontal leaf isn't going to cope on a hot day compared to something with a narrow, sort of drooping leaf. So there's a, a lot of layers that you can start to get into. So for us, a lot of our work is about imagining the future and we're learning from the, from the past. We just did a, a, a really interesting bit of work with, um, with dendrochronologists that we studied some of our trees going back about 150 years. So we now have this extraordinary set of data which looks at rainfall, temperature and tree growth for 150 years. And so that tells us that if uh, a plane tree, for example, gets a wet December, it will grow beautifully for, for, for all the summer. But if you're an elm tree, then it has to be wet in August and September. So, so understanding from the past is going to help us sort of think about the future. So if you jump on it. And, and the, other, the other aspect, I guess, of what we're doing is, is, is creating the green spaces that you've heard referred to. And you can see Westgate Park down on the bottom left-hand corner. And whilst it's not under our jurisdiction, it's sort of within our municipality. And